Dr. Pratita Vishwas, uh, Pratita Di, should we start? Yes. Uh, Join yeah, I think was sir actually. Sir, yeah. Okay, I think sir is already here. Okay. Good morning, sir. Okay, so let us start then. Uh, yes. A very good morning to our Honorable Chancellor, sir, Professor Samit Tre, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Dr. Dipendra Kumar Chao, our respected Pro Vice Chancellors, uh, Professor Sir Naveen Das, Professor Ujwal Kumar Chaudhary, and Professor Jitendra Pandey. Respected deans, directors present here, respected speakers, dignitaries, colleagues, and my dear students who are present. A very, very warm welcome to this virtual inaugural program of the Recording International World Research. The Center for Education, Research and Development, coordinated by our very own Dr. Praktita Vishwas, ma'am, aims at advancing interdisciplinary research in education and allied areas with a special focus on innovative research paradigms, emerging ideas in designing curriculum, and applications of multidisciplinary approaches in research. There is no denying the fact that research methods form an integral part of any discipline, and therefore demands our constant attention owing to the ever-changing approaches to study natural and social phenomena. In sync with the visions of the Center for Education, Research and Development, this international workshop on interdisciplinary applications and innovations in research methodology intends to disseminate knowledge about the implications of new research paradigms in related disciplines. The workshop incorporates a plethora of diverse topics on interdisciplinary research, including a guided exploration of how to initiate collaborative research, how to bring in responsible uh, innovations in research, as well as how to report research dissertation. And we are highly hopeful that in the next few days, all of us are going to be hugely benefited by the deliberations of our eminent speakers. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir Dr. Dipendra Jha, to deliver the inaugural speech for today. Sir, we are highly honored and extremely grateful to you for gracing this occasion with your presence. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Sir, please. Good morning, one and all. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Sumona. Thank you, Dr. Vishwas. Uh, you know, you know, since last year, you know, we have been talking about uh, these, uh, you know, the research center. And you are the first research center actually, uh, you know, coming up with this kind of program. Uh, extremely delighted. Uh, at the onset, I would like to first, uh, you know, welcome on behalf of Admiral University uh, to all the participants uh, and uh, delegates, all the keynote speakers, and you know, from India and abroad, uh, on this uh, international workshop on interdisciplinary applications and innovation in research methodology. Uh, it's a one-week program. Uh, I was going through. Uh, the list of the speakers and uh, uh, extremely delighted uh, that you know this is this is uh, something that very close to my heart uh, if you recall uh, only a few days back we had uh, we had a uh, workshop on uh, uh, you know interdisciplinary teaching and uh, teaching and learning so i think this is something uh, very similar i would say but then uh, more focused on research uh, in fact uh, Gone are the days when you know people used to talk about their disciplines only. I mean, still people do that, but then when they go to the workforce, they realize that you know it's it's the problem that they should have talked actually, not their domain. Whether your you know because the domains are inherently interdisciplinary. Hello, am I audible? 
Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. I think yes. it just uh, it got muted actually. Yeah. So uh, as I said, you know, twenty first century uh, is actually uh, the innovation will arise from problem oriented research. It's not about domain specific research, but it's about problem. So when we start talking about problem, inherently we will find that the problems are are interdisciplinary. They are not necessarily related to one domain. And those crossover, crossing over, you know, traditional faculties and disciplines are actually uh, 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 the crux of 21st century innovation. Therefore, we need a platform of interdisciplinary dialogue to choose transdisciplinary disciplinary problems like energy, health, uh, environment, information, uh, you know, welfare, public welfare, to name a few. And and cluster of uh, you know new platform of technology level innovation level application of those those research meaningfully where industry can actually find something uh, you know worthwhile uh, you know taking from uh, university it is happening but you know not uh, you know to to that uh, level where you know one would actually ideally like to know or uh, you know look for look. Look at this, uh, you know, University of Oxford, AstraZeneca. I mean, they, you know, collaboration. They came up with, you know, something really great, which is, which is the, uh, you know, talk of the hour actually these days. You know, the vaccine. So I think there is a lot of scope, uh, you know, in collaborating with industry and others. But I think taking this uh, ideas to implement it, that's where the innovation will come. And uh, in order to actually, uh, you know, focus on this. Uh, uh, you know, high level, uh, you know, research, which will be leading towards innovation. Adam as, you know, rightly pointed out by Dr. Dutta, that we have come up with uh, 10 research centers. Uh, and and th that's actually, uh, is all of them are actually interdisciplinary in this. So I'm sure that, you know, this, uh, this research centers as well, you know, uh, have, you know, people, researchers from across the boundaries, across the domain. So, so that's what, uh, you know, the focus is research and the production of knowledge becomes innovation, as I said, you know, when knowledge is applied in a new and novel manner to create new outcomes. So I'm sure that, you know, by, uh, you know, the innovative approach that this center is going to take, I'm sure that some, and not only this center, but even other centers that we are going to take, uh, that they are going to take, will bring forth some really path-breaking innovation. And then it will come in like intellectual property rights and, you know, all those things that will add value for the industry. Yeah. But if we talk about, you know, what kind of innovation that we have at the moment, you know, broadly, if I, I see, you know, out of, and, and there are several ways of, you know, defining those innovation categories. Uh, you know, product innovation is something uh, that people are, you know, researchers across the universities, across the, you know, nations, the universities are actually focus that, which actually describes changes in the thing, which is like, you know, products or services. So that, uh, I think to some extent, this kind of, uh, you know, innovation is going on. The second is position innovation, which says that changes in the context in which the products or services are introduced. So I think that product and position innovation, most of the universities are actually involved in. But if you see the last two categories, you know, which says one is process innovation, which says that changes in the ways in which product and, uh, you know, services are created uh, and delivered. And then the last is, you know, the category was the paradigm innovation. Like, you know, completely, uh, you know, changing the mental model, you know, the way that we have been thinking completely as, you know, you would have seen, you would have heard paradigm shift. So that kind of innovation is actually the future. And this process and paradigm innovation is what industry needs, is what the world needs. So I think we need to, while innovation is important, what kind of thing that we are making, what kind of thing we are innovating, that's also, because if we have to, uh, you know, sustain as a university, as a higher education institution, in future, probably 10 years from now, I think we need to look at these aspects of innovation. Uh, the current status, as I said, is, you know, product and, uh, you know, position innovation, but we need to go, you know, to paradigm innovation, which is arguably is the area that university can make a unique contribution, okay, in future. Uh, 
uh, as i said you know uni- universities or say we academician we all actually are equally uh, you know responsible uh, for this mindset we do not have uh, a responsibility like a government that you have to deliver or maybe after you know few years you will be replaced if you don't deliver somehow we have been like you know in 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 status quo most of the university we, we think that you know we are different uh, in the name of academic freedom you know we actually exercise certain things which we take for granted but then uh, that is not actually the case we because this is i always maintain this thing that uh, you know as darwin said long back that it is survival for the fittest so if we uh, you know if we do not change our mindset you know going forward it will be very difficult the way uh, you know teaching learning and other innovations are actually coming up and public participation is actually increasing look at the things like coursera linkedin learning for example uh, you know five year back there were many few very few of us would have heard about them but now this is a household name and going forward you know things like this where public you know academies they are going to uh, you know uh, intervene and then suddenly the education which was largely dominated by education institution they will get a tough fight there tough competitor there and which is which is for good only so that we need to also you know uh, look at some of the innovative approach innovative ways to actually uh, you know survive in this changing paradigm right so that's what i i want to make uh, you know point here uh, university also you know as i said we are not like a government we do not have a mission of charity or lobby groups yeah we do not have a you know kind of zero tolerance uh, you know uh, uh, procedure uh, zero tolerance uh, 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 to failure of industry you know industry have very tight uh, you know lines timelines deadlines and uh, you know what uh, they are supposed to come up with uh, like you know strict uh, we do not have any strict uh, economic imperative of private enterprise even but still we need to look at the future very keenly because uh you know time is running out and if we cannot shift our you know gears you know the researchers and all the educationists if they cannot shift the gear towards innovation and particularly the paradigm shift that you know it is required i think we will be in a serious trouble and many of the universities actually will lose their relevance so i think this is also a not only need of the hour it is actually a matter of our survival i would say so all the more reason uh, that we need to embrace an approach to innovation and reestablish i would say reestablish earlier we used to be uh, you know i mean perceived as center of innovation but now we need to uh, reestablish ourselves as a perceived center of innovation as i said you know if every research is actually inherently it uh, it is actually interdisciplinary right but i think we need to go towards innovation so very rightly uh, i would say the the theme of Uh, you know today's uh, uh, workshop uh, and this is one week workshop it says that interdisciplinary applications so uh, in and innovation so i think as i said it has to be a problem solving approach and problems are inherently interdisciplinary once again thank you so much for inviting me and i hope that the deliberations all the uh, you know uh, the keynote speeches and the, you know the learned people here are going to deliberate uh, on these features how can uh be a uh, all of us be a problem solver which is inherently interdisciplinary and i'm sure that our colleagues uh, at admas and the students who all are you know participating i think they all are going to be benefited out of this so thank you so much, so much and i wish this uh, walk so a great success thank you thank you very much sir and uh, we are really, really- really grateful to you for taking time out of your busy schedule and addressing this work, uh, you know in a girls uh, ceremony of the workshop so we are really really thankful to you sir for shedding light on the importance of interdisciplinary research and uh, what are the different aspects that we actually you know as researchers we need to focus on i'm very sure that uh, you know all our participants will be hugely benefited by your deliberation and i can see a lot of messages pouring in uh, our uh, chat section where people are actually you know uh, expressing their uh, you know uh, gratitude to you sir thank you very much okay uh, may i now request our uh, coordinator of the center for education research and development dr prasita vishwas 
uh, associate professor and the head of uh, the Department of Education to uh, say a few words about the Center for Education, Research and Development. Uh, Dr. Pratita Vishwas, please, ma'am, over yes. to you. Thank you, Shubhana, ma'am. Uh, a very good morning to you, sir, and to all the delegates, as well as uh, to all my colleagues and uh, uh, respected teachers. Uh, and uh, all those the participants who are very much interested for the love for research uh, who has come uh, and joined this uh, webinar and uh, workshop and uh, it was actually planned in a very short period of time to tell you very frankly but it was only possible because of uh, adamas university and because of honorable vice chancellor's motivation support of course uh, with the support of pro vice chancellor sir also and uh, the motivation of the research and development team and the newly formed team uh, so since uh, we are uh, today uh, sir has declared it open uh, so we would like to share some of the uh, objectives of the center for education uh, for uh, research and development uh, and our aim is to conduct research open for funding in national and international arena uh, to conduct interdisciplinary program in interdisciplinary area uh, and with as much as departments uh, which is to be catered to and uh, to establish a research collaboration with reputed NGOs and uh, we can do a joint program related to that and to involve innovative methods because as innovation Sir has told is one of the main key points or the highlights so innovative methods should be carried out uh, through research in different modern techniques as well as to emphasize on research publication in frontline journals which uh, we already are planning to and to promote uh, membership with uh, different bodies of course which are interdisciplinary and to collaborate with universities inter-research centers organizations which are open for funding collaboration as well as consultancy uh, work uh, joint programs uh, so that we can make it successful in the long run and uh, along with that uh, I would like to share with you uh, that uh, there is a team actually which is uh, headed by uh, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Jitendra Pandey sir and uh, uh, the Pro Professor Dr. Momita Mukherjee ma'am and uh, very quickly I will go to the team uh, which comprises of myself as the center coordinator, uh, Dr. Shoptoshi Chatterjee, sir, of the Department of uh, uh, Life Sciences, uh, Dr. Shumana, who is also hosting and the moderator, uh, who is the head of the Department of uh, Psychology, Mr. Sanjay Dotto of the Department of Education, Mr. Shayok Pal and Nitesh Tripathi of the School of Media and Communication, and our research scholar as well as uh, assistant professor of Adamas University. So uh, this is actually at present our team and uh, we are uh, inviting uh, more people so that they can come and join the uh, team and do good work related to it. Uh, so uh, related to it, I would like to say that uh, I hope that uh, with this inaugural uh, program, uh, this should be carried out in the long run and uh, the research innovation as well as we have an incubation and innovation uh, cell we all uh, form a part of the larger network as sir has told already a larger group and we form it in an interdisciplinary manner so that is all from my end uh, thank you all over to you shumana ma'am Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarchita Vishwas, for giving an overview about uh, the Center for Education, Research and Development, as well as uh, the team uh, team members who are involved in this uh, uh, novel uh, endeavor. Thank you again. Uh, I can see a lot of uh, you know messages which are coming in in the chat section, and people are introducing themselves. We are really uh, you know grateful and honored to have all of you here with us. Moving on to our uh, next session, we are extremely happy and honored to have with us today Professor Dr. Krishna Raj, the Vice President of FARM 
and Professor of Economics, Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bangalore, Karnataka. Sir has been extremely kind to accept our invitation to deliver the welcome address for today's program. Before handing over the platform to Professor Krishna Raj, let me just briefly introduce him before you. Professor Dr. Krishna Raj is uh, currently the professor at Center for Economics, uh, Studies and Policy Institute for Social and Economic Change, Isaac, Bangalore. He obtained PhD in economics from the University of Mysore. Most of his research work is in the field of environmental economics. He has 23 years of academic experience in research, teaching, training, and guidance. Earlier, he served as Indian Council for uh, Cultural Relations, ICCR, chairperson on Indian economy under the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India at Hancock University of Foreign Studies, Seoul, South Korea. He was a visiting scholar at University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, USA. He was awarded with Sir Ratan Tata Trust Research Fellowship for collaborative research with University of Wisconsin, USA. He has undertaken collaborative research with University of Guelph, Canada on water conflicts in Kaveri River Basin. He is the visiting professor to Kanur University, Kanur. He has undertaken several policy-oriented research projects. The policy research on unaccounted for water in Bangalore City and socioeconomic analysis of Bangalore Mysore Infrastructure Corridor Project for the House Committee and other research works have received high appreciation, good academic and policy response. He served as the expert committee member for the state and central governments. To mention a few, Government of Karnataka Committee for preparing the report on reservation and promotion by identifying the compelling reasons. Expert committee to study the issues of Karnataka State Open University after the withdrawal of UGC recognition. Currently, he is the expert committee member of National Green Tribunal, Government of India. He is also expert committee member of the Karnataka State Wetland Conservation Authority, Government of India. He is an expert committee member of the KSPCB and CPCB for estimation of environmental compensation. He has submitted many reports to the government of Karnataka which have policy implications. And he has a lot of contributions in developing all these different policies of the state government as well as the government of India. Currently, he has undertaken five research projects on green GDP, payment for ecosystem services, sustainable tourism, methodology for tourism statistics, auditing uh, of uh, tank filling schemes of CNNL and evaluation of SCNST entrepreneurs in Karnataka. He was invited as a keynote speaker to more than 10 conferences. Dr. Krishna Raja's work has been featured in national and international media. He has authored five books, 25 articles, 10 reports, book reviews, and popular articles in newspapers. And he has been invited several times as experts uh, at the you know, Vaibhav uh, Summit of Government of India to speak on sustainable development of India. He is uh, actually, uh, he, he has been a, a panel expert in live television programs of Doordarshan, All India Radio, and several private TV news channels on contemporary economic and environmental issues. He is a great teacher teaching uh, microeconomics for PhD students, economic thoughts of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar course at the Bangalore Ambedkar School of Economics. We are truly honored to have you here, sir. And uh, over to you now for your session. Thank you, Madam Summana Datta for uh, elaborate uh, introduction about me. I am highly delighted to be uh, the uh, uh, part of this uh, international workshop and uh, I uh, welcome all the participants. There are 330 participants. I'm very happy. First time I'm seeing online 330 participants. That shows that uh, how popular your uh, workshop program is going to be. Uh, uh, Professor uh, D.K. Ja, the respected uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Adamas University, and all the uh, academicians, 
of repute from the international uh, arena all the uh, researchers all the participants i welcome on behalf of uh, both adamas university as well as uh, the forum forum for interdisciplinary research methods so uh, yes uh, uh, professor ja explained already uh, the interdisciplinary research uh, has come to uh, stay for next uh, several centuries uh, uh, the before that uh, uh, i welcome uh, all the participants uh, there are uh, several participants uh, so then i will uh, speak on uh, the interdisciplinary uh, research and uh, innovative methods so adam Uni uh, Ad admas university research center for education research and development in collaboration with forum for interdisciplinary research method has organized an international workshop on the theme interdisciplinary applications and innovations in research methodology as i am the vice president of uh, forum for interdisciplinary method i am happy to welcome all the distinguished international academicians workshop participants and others associated with the program hope the workshop will be highly useful to gain knowledge in the interdisciplinary research and innovative methods to be taught by the experts for the next one week the forum has many scholars intellectuals and academicians within india and abroad i thank uh, the chancellor as well as the vice chancellor uh, professor samitre and uh, professor dipendra kumar ja for uh, extending their uh, support and cooperation for organizing this international workshop we seek more such support in the coming years and uh, i also extend uh, my welcome to dr ishma jakira dean awang had sale graduate school of arts and science university of utara malaysia i extend my best wishes uh, for dr uh, pratita biswas center, center coordinator associate professor and hod school of education admas university and, and the team in organizing this workshop so the importance of that uh, interdisciplinary research and also innovative methods were well explained by uh, professor ja in his uh, inaugural address so the areas of research are nowadays are more interdisciplinary in nature sometimes we call it multidisciplinary also so they are evolving they are also very dynamic and uh, continually emerging and transforming the knowledge and they are called as interdisciplinary research because many researchers are coming together to understand the societal problems or issues and find a, a a proper solution which can be highly practical for the even for the public policy so therefore the interdisciplinary research has emerged as the new way of doing combined research by the team of researchers or individuals cutting across all the discipline in the inter interdisciplinary research it tries to integrate information data techniques tools perspectives concepts and also theories from two or more disciplines or bodies of specialized knowledge to advance fundamental understanding or to solve problems whose solutions are beyond the scope of single discipline or area of research practice so the world has come to this level the world is considered nowadays as a, 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 a we uh, the knowledge world we are in the 21st century we are in the era of knowledge and wisdom 
so as you would know there are no uh, uh, boundaries uh, uh, demarcated now and all the walls between the disciplines have been collapsed so now today we have world without walls www so there are no uh, 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 restrictions to conduct research uh, in the interdisciplinary way because the society uh, we are in which we are living is considered as the knowledge society sometimes we are also called as the knowledge economy because of the growing uh, of the uh, the dominance of the service sector so the world is drastically moving towards application of applications of science and technology therefore uh, the economy uh, is knowledge economy it is driven by the knowledge economy uh, as professor mentioned even intellectual property rights and um, uh, the growing number of uh, publications in interdisciplinary uh, research journals and also the uh, collaboration which are taking place at the international level and the research we are doing at the isec and other uh, research organizations they are nowadays having the nature of interdisciplinary in nature and no more they are uh, uh, and no more they are restricted or confined to the discipline we study so but especially in recent uh, years after the growth of and application of communication uh, uh, ict information and communication technology the way we are living the way we are thinking the way we are doing research the way we are understanding the society has been changing so even today uh, you know that um, uh, we are today we are uh, uh, using the web portal we are using the uh, internet uh, online services for uh, uh, conducting the uh, meetings uh delivering the lectures and this is the way we are learning nowadays because of the use of uh, increasing use of uh, information and communication technology this is the way we have to live especially under this uh, pandemic so the artificial intelligence uh, and social media have come to uh, uh, our doorsteps so they are playing a dominant role the way we work and the way the society Uh, behaves and the society understand uh, the um, uh, problems of society so the knowledge uh, uh, production nowadays is considered as interdisciplinary in nature when the knowledge is produced in a in an interdisciplinary nature so that requires interdisciplinary uh, approaches and interdisciplinary uh, uh, ideas because you know that uh, the inquisitive inquisitiveness or the enquiry uh, of a, a researcher the enquiry uh, of a man uh, for the various domains of knowledge uh, for the pursuit of uh, uh, knowledge and also solving societal problems that de demands application of scientific methods so understanding sub the subject matter in an interdisciplinary way is very simple but the application of methods scientific methods for solving the uh, 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 societal problem is more technical in nature so that needs uh, a training a proper training that needs a a proper uh, understanding of the technique and uh, that also uh, um, uh, the scientific methods uh, cannot be used in a day or two it requires a lot of modifications over a period of time a lot of thinking a lot of research a lot of uh, ideas have to come from the uh, uh, different uh, group of researchers to evolve some models which can be uh, universally applicable so therefore the pursuit of knowledge seeks uh, to identify and apply scientific methods involving the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches the scientific knowledge grows with the passage of time in studying the multitudes of emerging problems the society the society faces in the 21st century the scientific research methods help researchers to study the research issues or problems in an interdisciplinary perspective 
to find an appropriate policy suggestions, which is highly useful for the government. For instance, to study the impact of climate change on economy and society, and also on environment, provides an opportunity to the group of researchers, like economists, ecologists, and uh, uh, engineers, uh, come together to do a collaborative research and find a scientific methods for applying how to uh, study the uh, the impact of climate change on economy and society and also the environment. So therefore, uh, evolving uh, scientific methods requires a, a collaborative research and also interdisciplinary approach. The advancement of information and communications technology and its application in scientific research is highly prevalent today. The ICT has tremendously influenced uh, uh, the accuracy and reliability of research findings with the development and increasing applications of statistical and math mathematical softwares. However, uh, the skill development among the research to do scholarly research with the use of new statistical soft software is lagging in most of the developing countries, including in India, due to absence of specialized research institutes in higher education. So there is a huge demand for the pursuit of knowledge in applications of scientific methods in research from the young researchers in India in order to publish their research work uh, in the standard research journals and uh, publications. To fill this avoid, uh, we, uh, the like-minded researchers uh, came together and we, um, uh, we established uh, a forum called Forum for Interdisciplinary Research Methods uh, in, in 2019. And uh, there are many uh, interdisciplinary uh, academicians are involved uh, in uh, teaching and guiding and also conducting various training programs for the young researchers. So this uh, firm aims to provide a platform for researchers by uh, organizing workshops training programs like this, national and international conferences for the benefit of researchers to exchange their research ideas and findings. As part of this mission, the Forum for Interdisciplinary Research Method has organized several workshops in the past and continues to encourage uh, institutes like uh, Admas University to conduct interdisciplinary research. As the Vice President of of uh, Young Forum, I wish many more workshops and training programs like this uh, in collaborative way. And I wish all the academicians and researchers who participate in the workshop to benefit from the lectures and discussions. I wish all the success for the workshop. Hello. Over to you, Thank you, sir. you madam. Over to you. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much, sir, for uh, in you know uh, delivering the welcome address and uh, you know sh shedding light on uh, you know how much uh, you know we need to uh, uh, put more focus on this uh, interdisciplinary uh, approaches of uh, doing research, and we are very much aware that you are involved in lot and lots and lots of uh, different such kind of researches and it is uh, really uh, you know beneficial for all of us to hear all these uh, from you so thank you very much again uh, i would uh, like to uh, uh, ask the participants if you have anyone is having any uh, question or anything please uh, or any uh, suggestion anything you can write uh, in the chat box uh, There are a lot of appreciations for your uh, session. Thank sir. you very much, madam. If you have, uh, if participants have any questions, I am happy to answer. And uh, uh, one thing I would like to um, uh, add here is that uh, among the countries uh, in the world, the Indian uh, researchers, they are more into uh, interdisciplinary research. Uh, one of the research papers I have seen recently uh, published uh, uh, in uh, Nature Journal. So that shows that uh, the interdisciplinary research is uh, on the rise uh, among the social scientists as well as natural scientists. 
uh, they are coming together uh, to understand the societal problems and uh, they are publishing papers research papers uh, in the uh, interdisciplinary journals not in the domain journals uh, they are publishing their uh, works research outcomes in the interdisciplinary uh, journals so india tops in that uh, that is uh, india uh, is ranked uh, one of the top uh, institute uh, country uh, which is publishing in the interdisciplinary journal after that china comes then uh, the third position goes to taiwan and fourth is south korea and uh, fifth is uh, brazil uh, sixth is italy and even uh, seventh position is uh, in united states we consider the united states is states as the uh, hub of knowledge and uh, they do a lot of interdisciplinary research when it comes to publication india is publishing uh, more papers in interdisciplinary journals when compared to other advanced countries and uh, uh, the second thing is that uh, 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 this interdisciplinary research have more impact on the policy when compared to uh, the uh, uh, disciplinary uh, research outcomes this is also uh, 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 this is also uh, published in the nature journal uh, the outcome of the research is more impactful uh, by the researchers who have interdisciplinary research approach and uh, third thing is that uh, some fields are more interdisciplinary than others say for example economics uh, is more dis uh, interdisciplinary when compared to sociology and political science and uh, business administration and uh, they are also um, more interdisciplinary in nature when compared to uh, other uh, uh, basic social science uh, disciplines like sociology political science anthropology like that so economics is more dynamic uh, in terms of adapting to the uh, inter interdisciplinary research and uh, uh, the way they uh, for example uh, ecological economics environmental economics even uh, a behavioral economics has come to uh, uh, to the timeline recently you know that where uh, the neuroscientist the psychologist and the economist have come together to resolve solve the problem in decision making how consumers and producers they take decision whether they take purely on the basis of uh, uh, the uh, monetary benefits or they are also uh, taking decision based on the altruistic way and other other uh, uh, factors which influence the decision so in this way uh, the interdisciplinary research is uh, more and more uh, a reality nowadays when compared to the last uh, decade yes madam yes uh, thank you very much sir i mean uh, actually i definitely i myself didn't know about uh, uh, this publication which you talked about uh, it's uh, i think uh, many of the participants also you know are uh, you know saying in the chat section that uh, they are very much in intrigued to know about this particular uh, publication yeah, which you talked about I, I, so, i'll uh, i'll give yeah. you the title of this um, uh, paper okay. interdisciplinary research by the numbers okay uh, interdisciplinary in, research by the numbers okay. yeah a nature a special issue if you go to nature.com all right you'll all get right. that paper okay 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 so the author is Uh, Richard Van uh, Noorden. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, sir, for providing this information. And I really hope that uh, platforms like this, uh, you know, will provide a lot of opportunities to, uh, you know, all the researchers from around the country to exchange their thoughts, their knowledge, and their, uh, you know, uh, uh, ways of looking at things. to bring together something which is much more productive and uh, applicable for the society at large so uh, thank you again very much sir for enlightening us with so many new things we didn't know about thank you again thank you ma'am thank you okay uh, so moving on to our next session i would like to invite uh, uh, mr imam shamim uh, professor shamim senior lecturer department of english southeastern 
uh, University of Sri Lanka. And also the Oliville and Research Scholar, uh, the University of Tara, Malaysia. Shamim, sir, are you here? Yes. Yes, uh, ma'am. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. 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 Hello, sir. How are you? Okay, fine. And thank I you, would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much for yeah. inviting us. And I would like to request you to now kindly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Zakaria for our next session. Sir. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Before introducing our guest speaker, let me introduce myself. I am Samir, senior lecturer from Southeastern University of Sri Lanka, who has 23 years of experience as an PhD scholar from uh, University of Uttara, Malaysia. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Adams University. Professor Dr. Mumita Mukardi, Dean, Dean uh, Research and Development, Adam University. Our, our, our earlier our previous speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Krishna Raj, Professor Economics in Field for Social and Economic Change, Bangalore, India. Dr. Pratika Biswas, Associate Professor and Head of Education and Research Center Coordinator. Distinguished guests, researchers, academics, administrators, students, ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters. First of all, let me thank the Vice Chancellor and the organizing committee for organizing such a grand academic session and give me an opportunity to be part of this webinar during the pandemic lockdown period. Though there are many negative impacts of uh, the corona economic, uh, on economic and social, there are some positive side as well, especially in the educational transformation. We have got many opportunities for networking and international collaboration and virtual learning in the global village. Hope Adam University also got an opportunity to collaborate with UEM Malaysia and our um, other universities around the world. It is a great pleasure in introducing a world renowned eminent professor who is an NLP coach and soft skill trainer and role model for many people. Professor Hizam Zakaria is a highly accomplished and renowned scholar, academician and trainer, and has an extensive work experience of 30 years. He carries a wide range of experience with University of Uttara, Malaysia and 20 years into corporate training. He receives a PhD degree in lifelong learning from University of East Anglia, United Kingdom. And also he got MSc in linguistics from uh, Michigan State University, USA, and earned a double bachelor degree from uh, a degree with honors in economics and applied linguistics from Canada. Professor Hisam is currently an associate professor and Dean of Avanghat Saleh Graduate School at College of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Uttara, Malaysia, and a master trainer into neuro-linguistic programming trainer who has been conferred with international certification from USA, Canada, and Malaysia. Professor Hizam is a specialist in learning for professional development, facilitator, mentor, coach, and his attachment with Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver, Canada between 2011 and 2013, gave him a grown his interest on patient into lifelong learning and democ democratizing education for all. He has published extensively and pursuing various research in the area of technology and language learning, communication, open distance education, learning support, adult education, and lifelong learning. As an NLP certified coach, Professor Hizam brings to his workshop with varied professional experience for public and private sectors. He delivers courses and workshops on lifelong learning and training, and Rabagi, leadership education, leadership for supervision, supervisory skills, and other soft skills such as communication, presentation, and skill, interpersonal skills, creativity, and so on. Professor Hizam Zakaria has delivered training and taught courses for various organizations in Malaysia and Asian region. He has worked with Sri Lanka Ministry of Education, various Thailand universities, and Vietnam the Ministry of Tourism, and many various institutions, Malaysia, banks, and private sectors. To be honest, he's my guru and role model. He's a role model for many people in Malaysia and around the world. I don't have enough time to talk about Professor's full profile. Sir, podium is yours. 
Hope all will enjoy your session. So it's over to you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Samim. Bismillah uh, rahman rahim Assalamualaikum. Uh, greetings from University of Utara, Malaysia. Can you all hear me yes, well? Sir. Okay. Um, thank you to Madam Samona Datta, who is the chairperson of the uh, conference. I would, like, uh, I would like first to greet uh, Professor uh, Dipendra, yeah, the Vice Chancellor all the senior uh, management team from Adamas University, the organizer committee that is organizing the conference, yeah, uh, uh, titled in the Interdisciplinary Applications and Innovations and Research Methodology, yeah, which is very timely. I think this is a very impressive platform. I can see, you know, you have over 300 participants uh, that simply, uh, in a nutshell, you know, uh, surfaced by saying, wow, that is actually uh, a, a quite a big crowd. Uh, also to Prof. Krishna Raj, who has spoken, I think between you and Professor Dipendra, you have actually spoken a wide range and, and, and issues and also the significance of this uh, platform that we have today. Uh, so much so, I think you have taken all my points. I got nothing else to say. <laughs> anyway, but certainly uh, there's a lot that, that can be said more uh, on, on this issue, on interdisciplinary application. But before I get into my uh, keynote for today, uh, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to um, University of Uttar Malaysia. As what Samir has just mentioned briefly just now, we are the sixth uh, university in Malaysia. We were actually uh, born in 1984, so we have actually, this is actually our 37th year uh, anniversary. Uh, though small, we are actually progressing and growing very big. Uh, we are now ranked 501 to 550 uh, in the world ranking, QS ranking. Uh, our ranking is on the rise every year, which is very good, yeah. Uh, we do have about 40,000 students uh, uh, encompassing the undergraduate as well as the postgraduate students. Uh, we have uh, 17 faculties here on campus. It's a very big campus comprising 1,400 hectares of land. Um, I would like first to invite all of you, you know, uh, when the pandemic is well contained, hopefully uh, we pray to God that it will be contained very soon. When it is well contained, I would like to actually invite all of you to come and visit us Okay, we are located in the northern region. So our name, University of Taramashi, if you were to translate that into English, it meant uh, the Northern University of Malaysia. So we are just about five, 10 kilometers away from Thailand, uh, which is, uh, we are strategically lo located. We are surrounded by the greenery of tropical forests. Yeah, in the morning, I think Samim can, can, can um, uh, support this notion. In, in, in the morning, you can see thousands of monkeys around. So we are very close to nature. Uh, we are one of the greatest uh, bird watching sanctuary and for those who love bird watching. Uh, we have plenty to offer. Yeah. So when the good times come, please uh, make time to visit us. And likewise, we will also looking forward to do a lot of collaboration and working together. I think the theme going to the future is working together. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at my title today, Exploring Frontiers in Collaborative Research Building, yeah? Synergy and Mutual Goal, that is what I'm going to be focusing on. And I'm going to be focusing more on education, uh, where my passion lies. Um, okay, um, but before I, I, I get into that, I also wanted to say, yeah? uh, if, you, uh, if you can go to the next page, please. Okay, so what is new? Uh, I think just now Sami mentioned, um, the Honorable Vice Chancellor mentioned, uh, and also uh, Prof. Krishna also mentioned a little bit about, about COVID-19, the pandemic that is actually affecting the whole world. Uh, I always say that the pandemic COVID-19 certainly offer good, bad and ugly, yeah. And the ugly part, I think uh, India knows this very well, Malaysia also is undergoing a lockdown at the moment. The ugly part is, of course, uh, pertaining to the death that is actually impacting Malaysia, impacting India, impacting the rest of the world, yeah? Uh, we got so many deaths, so that is ugly, and certainly uh, we feel uh, certainly uh, very sad about uh, those people who have been dying, who, who has actually uh, uh, vanished from the world because of this COVID-19. And the bad thing is, of course, uh, how 
pandemic, uh, COVID-19 is actually impacting all of us. It's impacting education in a, in a very big way. If you look at today, there are so many universities out there, so many colleges that are very nearing to actually closure simply because they don't have revenue. Students are not back. Uh, buildings that are, are supposed to be rented, you know, revenues are not being made. Uh, so students are not, you know, are, are not, are not back in, in the, the, the traditional way. So there are many universities, even in, in the United States, America, they are facing a very hard time to actually uh, progress into the future, yeah, because so much has been lost. So that is the bad part. So it's, it, it's bad because it's impacting our life. It's bad because every facet of our life is being impacted. Yeah, whether it is social life, whether it is our educational, our career, our family life, it is impacting all of us. Yeah, so we are all going through the same pandemic. Nevertheless, the pandemic also, I believe strongly, and I think many of you would, would concur with me, that it also provides a, a lot of good, yeah, a lot of opportunities actually being created. I'll give you one example. Uh, we have been talking about, well, in Malaysia at least, we've been talking about uh, uh, online, going online. Um, in fact, online is nothing new, but it, does, it has not picked up in a very big way. But COVID-19 has certainly brought about uh, a lot of change. Today, everybody is doing their teaching online. Today, learning is online. Today, virtual learning is everywhere. Today, remote learning is the buzzword that people are using and we are all doing that, yeah? So COVID-19 has also brought about a lot of uh, opportunity for us to build network. So unlike any traditional keynote where, you, where normally the keynote would actually give the uh, takeaway points at the end of the keynote, I'm going to give you my takeaway point now before getting into my slides. My, and my takeaway points are only three words. Okay, when we talk about research, when we talk about in, uh, interdisciplinary applications and innovations, my three keywords in my speech today are the following. First is create, the second one is innovate, and the third one is inspire. So we certainly have to create opportunities, we have to innovate um, approaches and, and how we do research, okay, and we have to inspire. Right, because what we had so far, the um, uh, the methodology that we have so far, these are all man-made. I think it's timely for us to actually to venture out new approaches. We have to venture out in the innovation, and we have to create uh, many different approaches that are creative, so that we can sustain and then we can do better, more more research, more collaborations worldwide. Okay, can we go next, please? So if you look at into my next page, can we go to the next page? If you go, if you go into my next page, yeah? So the title of my next page is The New Normal. Um, slowly, if you look around us, people, human beings, uh, people on your left, on your right, uh, your communities are slowly adopting, assimilating, integrating yeah new normalcy so what is the new normalcy people are always you know it is becoming the buzzword of today the new normal the new normalcy so we are slowly adopting and assimilating and integrating the new normalcy into our daily life and livelihood it all pertains to change we have to be able to adapt in fact i would say very strongly that adaptability is the new competency of today all right in education in research we have to adopt we have to adopt new ways and that must be the new one of the new competency that we must have we must create we must learn we have to learn to 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 do and to redo to to to, to learn and to relearn all the fundamental skills in order for us to actually surface and and become better in a new normalcy and this is true for all segments and phases of human life and activities, including education. So the new normal actually warrants us to actually change. We have to be adaptive. We have to be flexible. In fact, flexibility is the uh, one of the best strategy moving forward. Yeah. Can we move to the next page, please? So if you, if you look at the next page of my uh, PowerPoint, which is titled COVID-19 and its impact on education. Can we go to the next page, please? 
So um, while waiting for my next page to come, I'm going to say that globally, COVID-19 yeah, is impacting every nation. It's impacting Malaysia, it's impacting India in a very big way, it's impacting US, although US is actually be, it, it's coming out slowly but surely because of the progress of vaccination that they, that they have. Yeah? But certainly it's impacting every nation, educational system and institution. Yeah? So that provides opportunities for us to do more research. Yeah? Where it's impacting, it's meaning, it, it means that it's changing the education system, how students are learning, how teachers are teaching, how we support lifelong learning. Yeah? Uh, students and teachers of all ages from K-12 to universities and colleges are all being impacted. Institutions are struggling to stay relevant. Yeah? Uh, some institutions, they're very slow to actually change. Uh, again, I think three keywords. Just now I've given you the takeaway points. I'm going to give you three more um, that actually are also the fundamentals of what we need to do. First one is actually speed. How fast do we actually change? How fast do we actually approach and make the right decision? Yeah? Speed is the essence of everything. Speed is the essence of success. The secondly is flexibility of, of, of being flexible. I think that is also that paramounts everything. If you're not flexible, and you know, there, there, there's a, there is a phrase that says that if we are very rigid, we become stupid, is it not? So flexibility is something that we have to have, that we have to do. Yeah? And the third one is visibility. How visible are we? as researchers, how visible are we uh, being part of one community, being part of one institution? How visible is Adama's university to the world, right? So if we become more visible, then more opportunities will kick in, okay? So institutions are struggling to stay relevant. And this is, this, is, this is the reality. There are so many institutions that are not progressing well because they do not know how to stay relevant, yeah? struggling to cope and remain open amidst declining revenue. So when revenue are not coming, uh, some institutions, small and big, are facing a lot of issues, okay? Teachers and students are struggling to teach and learn, okay? Because online learning in, in Malaysia, for example, I'm, I'm giving you a case study of Malaysia. Online learning in the past is not, uh, it's not the dominant approach in teaching. It is part of uh, open University in Malaysia. It is part of Wawasan University in Malaysia, but certainly the traditional conventional universities, we do a blending a system where, you know, some courses we have open, uh, we have uh, online uh, approaches and some other courses we have dominantly or face-to-face. -face, yeah? So when we have online learning, teachers and students are struggling to teach and learn. Yeah? Learners do not know how to learn at home. Uh, teachers do not know how to actually make their online learning much more interesting, much more appealing. Because we know that the attention, uh, retention rate among students, or even among ourselves, when we watch a movie, if the movie is not good, then your retention could be only uh, could only be ten minutes or maybe less than that. Yeah. If you're reading a book and the book is no good, it's not you know not appealing enough, you may want to toss the book after five minutes because the retention um, between human beings are very unique and very different. So the issue of how do you make your online learning appealing and engaging uh, is something that is of a a great challenge to many. But today, after one year of going through um, all this lockdown and, and, and COVID-19, I think we are getting uh, uh, getting good at what we do. Yeah? But still, there's a lot of issues that a lot of um, possibilities, a lot of areas that we should be able to do research and collaborative research and also comparative research between institutions, between nations. I think it's something that we want to uh, to, to get into the future. That's why I said just now, we have to create, we have to innovate, and we have to inspire people so that we can work uh, together yeah, as one. It doesn't matter whether you're in India, whether you're in Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea, but if we can work together uh, as researchers, I think we can explore more issues. And the best thing is, we can provide a universal case uh, for us to learn. Yeah. Uh, okay, can we go to the next uh, page, please? Can I get the host to change the PowerPoint to the next page? Okay, go on to the next page. I've already talked about this. Go on to the next page. Next page. Okay, right. So uh, let's do a quick reality check here, yeah? So we teachers, yeah? Uh, so we here, I, I'm referring to teachers, school, colleges, professors, uh, still have the 
obligation to render our services to our students. No matter what happened, uh, whether it's COVID or whether it's something else, we as teachers, we still have to teach. We still have to actually improve our teaching. So that, that also opens up different avenues for us to do um, research. And, and when teaching and learning is concerned, it cut across all discipline, right? So teaching and learning is not owned by education per se, but it is also owned by other disciplines. So this is where the, the word interdisciplinary uh, is apt and is something that we have to explore. We must, you must all remember this, that we must break the compartmentalization yeah, in the past, I think uh, people in biology, they only do biology research. People in economics, they do economics research. People in communication, they do economic, uh, communication research. But we all know that communication cuts across all discipline. Yeah? We, we all know that languages cut across all discipline. We know that education cuts across all discipline. So this conference calling for interdisciplinary approach is very timely because that is precisely what we have to do because we have to beat the compartmentalization that we have been holding so long Right? We have to break that and, 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 and build a new culture of research where we work together. The world, my brothers and sisters are becoming small. Yeah? You can now fly to New York you know, with, with plus or minus 16 hours compared to when I was, uh, I, I was a, a, a teenager before when I flew to Canada. It took me about 34 hours to get from A to B. Yeah? So world have changed. The world is becoming very small. Networking is what we have to do. So we have to create, we have to innovate, and we have to inspire. We still have to ensure education is provided to students. Yeah, Whether we like it or not, whether it's COVID or something else, that is what we have to do. We have that obligation. We have to ensure that education is provided. I'm a, uh, I'm a strong advocate of democratizing education. And when I was working with Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver, Canada, that's what we, we do precisely. Yeah? We, we, we help to democratize education, whether you are in Africa, whether you are in Nepal, whether you don't have buildings and you don't have uh, the four walls to actually call a classroom. We provide the platform for you to have education and education is the essence of success right so we have to continue doing that and students have to learn all right whether you like it or not we all have to learn and we don't stop learning till we go to the six foot under apartment down there and i'm sure all of us have not been down there otherwise we won't be here isn't it yeah so we have to continue to learn students have to learn students have to grow we have to grow as well nation future depends on our youngsters india will become better greater and and, and that can be propelled by the new generations that you have today. So similarly, Malaysia, Singapore, all nations, Korea, we are all are dependent on our youngsters. So if they are well-educated, if they are mature enough, if they are well-trained, if they get the best education and exposure, they can actually propel, propel our nation, propel India, propel Malaysia to uh, a level that we have never seen before. Okay, can we go to the next page, please? Next page, please. <clears throat> so on the next page, yeah, if, if I can get the, um, the host to go to my next page. Yeah, thank you. So these are the key questions, yeah. The new normal demand change to what we do and practice. So as researchers, what can we do? How can we change our approaches? Uh, what kind of research should we actually embark and pursue, right? So, so we have to actually ask this. And I have said just now that COVID-19 offers good, bad, and ugly, yeah? So there's a lot of issues that we can actually focus on and we can also do research. We do research because we wanted to supply or offer solutions. So we have that, that obligation. Secondly is how do we teach and provide good learning opportunities to our students? So again, Coming to COVID-19, uh, this is still a relevant issue. How do we teach and provide good learning opportunities to our students? Knowing that, I've said earlier just now, that the retention rate in online learning and the attrition rate in online courses are very high. So how can we do better? What kind of research should we do? Perhaps collaboration research, comparative research of on, on these issues between Malaysia and India, between Malaysia and Sri Lanka and all that can actually help us to better understand and we must learn from each other. The third question that I have are, how do we cope and manage all factors? 
okay? Uh, how do we support and manage remote learning? How do we support online learning? So these are key questions, okay? Next, how do we ensure learning and teaching is engaging and interactive? This is key. How do you make sure students are able to return uh, better? Yeah, how do we make sure that students are able to sit down and watch a 40 minutes video or, 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 or follow their online learning without any difficulty? How do we ensure all that? How do we make our courses engaging? How do we make our courses fun? Fun equals learning. Yeah? If they are having fun, they are actually learning. But how do we ensure all that when we are not so used to all this? So there's a lot of opportunities here for us to do collaborative research, yeah? interdisciplinary. Uh, here means that you, you, know, you want to take a, a bit, you want to focus a little bit on the technology side, you know, on the content side, on the human side, and on the learning and teaching. So there's a lot of different discipline or different uh, segment that can actually mix into you know into into one where we where we do a very good uh, comparative interdisciplinary research yeah and of course uh, one of the uh, I mean the, the question I asked here it's not exhaustive at all. There are many more questions. And of course, how do we ensure quality? So again, there are a whole range of issues that we can all look at that we can actually do and, and ponder and do more research. Okay, can we go to the next page, please? Next page, please. So the next page focus on the reality on research opportunities. And these are the reality. There are many various areas and issues in our new normal that is worthy yeah, to be researched <clears throat> for the good of mankind. <clears throat> so like I say, uh, pandemic 19 offers a lot of opportunities. Yeah, But if, 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 if we decide that pandemic 19 is only offering sorrow and sadness, then, then we, are, we are going to be losing a lot of things. So we want to take it, take it, Hard, but be positive that good times will come. But as educationists and also as a researcher, I think Pandemic 19 is offering all of us, whether you are in India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Singapore, wherever you are, a great deal of opportunities to actually do more research for us to better understand on coping mechanism, for example, yeah, on, on teaching, on, on learning. How do people uh, teach in India? Perhaps we can learn more from our India uh, counterparts. How do you actually help your teachers and support your teachers in the pandemic eras? And how do you actually move forward uh, in, in the near future? But, but, but my, my next question is again, how do we move forward? How do we actually get from A to B and how do we actually become better and survive all these um, uh, one or two years of this pandemic? How do we empower our fellow researchers yeah, to explore and find research opportunities. So this is where I said, so the, the, the three takeaway points I mentioned briefly just now, uh, which refers to uh, create, innovate, and inspire is very important. We have to inspire researchers, inspire all of them so that they are, they are motivated, so that they want more, so that they are hungry for knowledge. We researchers are always hungry for, for knowledge. We have to be passionate in what we do, yeah? So how do we strategize? How do we strategize? Okay, can we go to the next page? So let's focus on research in education. So if you go to the next page, please. Can we, okay. Um, so what is your passion and interest? What do you want to research? I think these are key questions, yeah? Uh, moving forward, these are key questions. Uh, possibilities are endless. There are so many issues. I've already explained to you all the uh, issues that we have. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, my interest passion is more on teaching and learning. Learners support, yeah, open distance learning and others. So these are my area of interest in research. And, and please note that we have today, if you look at India, if you look at your home country, if I look at Malaysia, and if you look around us, uh, I think we have loads of, re of resources. We got so much to offer. But the very question that I want to pose today is, are we resourceful in managing those resources? So as a good educational uh, educationalist, as well as a good researcher, I think in terms of resources, we have plenty, yeah? Um, we communicating between Malaysia and India and Sri Lanka and other nations. I, th I think that those are resources. Um, money is resources, yeah. Um, 
Our students are also resources. The issues that we have between nations are also resources. The methodology that we have in research, those are also resources. But how do we actually become more resourceful so that we can actually tap on everybody's uh, uniqueness and everybody's strength so that we can move forward and do a better job in, in future research, yeah? Can we go to the next page? So ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, if we go to the next page, title is learners are unique, yeah? <clears throat> can we go to the next page, please? Okay, so everywhere, learners are unique. Learners could be the same or very different with one another. This is true in Malaysia. This is true uh, among learners in India as well. They can be very similar or they can be very different. And what works for some may not work for others, yeah? So COVID-19 has brought upon many issues in education from technological support, Wi-Fi availability, digital competency, adaptability, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the world will never find certainty as opposed to uncertainty into what the future holds post-COVID. We do not know because situations in Malaysia, situations in India, I think are still very liquid. Uh, even, but, but being liquid, I think more or less, yes, it is bad, but it is also good for research because it, uh, it offers again, uh, many opportunity. As such, we have to work and ensuring that we are speedy. So these are the points that I wanted to share just now. We must be speedy enough yeah, to change. Uh, our approaches. We must also be flexible enough to change and we must also be visible uh, to do uh, our part in research. I think, as I said, if, if people uh, know where UUM is located, people know where Adamas University is located, and we are very much visible to the eye of other researchers in other parts of the world, then we can do more research together. Yeah. So let's do more research, collaborative research and comparative research. Outcomes will be better network, we will have better network, we will have better publication and more. And yeah? there's a lot of uh, opportunities out there. Okay, can we go to the next page? So plausible solution, if we go to the next page, um, one of the finest uh, option in education today is to adopt a blended approach in our teaching and learning and researching, yeah? Blended here, um, blended here, you know, it, it, all that I wanted to say here, it, it pertains to us beating the compartment that we are sitting in, right? We have, we, we must not practice compartmentalization. We must break from that. We must blend our expertise with other people. We must be able to share our strong uh, points and our, our, our strength with others. We must be able to learn from others. I think that is crucial. The more we learn from each other, I think, uh, universally, I think the world will become a better world, yeah. I think there's a lot that educationists can do. The world is a better world today because of the work of our teachers, because of the work of, of educationists in the past, right? Um, all the, um, you know, successful people of today, they are very successful because of their teachers. So we educationists, I think we have the role to actually to educate, to re-educate. We also must also learn and relearn. Um, engineer and re-engineer of how we do things and how we do research in the future. Okay, can we go to the next page? I'm coming to an end of on my keynote. Can we go to the next page, post? So if you go to the next page, um, I'm asking why blended, yeah? So as, as educators, we have to serve all learners all types of learners and able to support their learning. So uh, I'm talking this in the perspective of education, but it is also parallel to any uh, discipline out there. Yeah? Uh, blended approach allows us to actually mix and match and plan teaching and learning and researching in a way that is much flexible, inviting and appealing. I think this is the way forward. Uh, blended learning harness yeah? uh, student-centeredness or issue-centeredness and in, 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 it, in its approach. So basically when we do um, uh, interdisciplinary research or when we blend expertise, yeah, uh, when we actually learn from each other, I think uh, we are actually helping to solve a lot of world issues together. Yeah, it allows and support more opportunities for us, for students and teachers to be more creative and innovative. And certainly it will also allow us as researchers to become more creative and innovative as such. Right, my uh, takeaway points, as I mentioned earlier on, are three words. Yeah, number one is to create. We have to create uh, a lot of opportunities, research opportunities that we can build between 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 nation, between institutions. 
we must be flexible enough to actually uh, change and make the make decision to be collaborative. We have to collaborate, yeah? we have to actually work together. And of course, the third one is to inspire. We have to inspire people. We have to inspire our co-researchers, our researchers. We have to inspire researchers between nations to actually work together. I think moving forward, those are the things that I, I think is, 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 is very much important. And when can we go to the next page? Um, if you go to the next page, um, I'm just sharing with you um, some of uh, my preliminary research findings yeah, on, 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 on what I have researched before. So, if, so here, um, in, in fact, in, in, in learning and teaching, uh, students uh, prefer or they favor blended learning. As such, um, it is also parallel. I, I think there are many research, researchers in Malaysia that I've talked about too, uh, also in favor of actually blending and doing collaboration and working together, yeah? Uh, students felt that they learn as much or more than they did in traditional method of teaching and learning. So like, so vice versa, if you do research and you do interdisciplinary research, I think researchers will find it much more engaging, much more meaningful. And the best thing is uh, we researchers or co-researchers between nations, between institutions can learn from each other, yeah? So, so uh, there's a lot more into actually working together, yeah? Okay, can we go to the next page? Okay, so uh, just now I've already shared my takeaway point. So the first takeaway point was to create, innovate, and inspire, yeah? So the new normal warrants all stakeholders yeah, in education to always be ready for the uncertainty and to, to continuously create, innovate, and inspire. Yeah? There will always be a solution to all issues. So COVID-19 certainly have a lot of issues that it brought upon us, but certainly human beings are very fast uh, in, in, in trying to mitigate and, 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 um, and, and we are all stormed with surprises that, you know, the vaccine for COVID-19 came much earlier than what is projected. You know, initially when they projected that the vaccine can only uh, be produced 18 months, which is, you know, um, not even today, uh, but, but it was produced less than a year. So uh, again, when, when human beings are pushed into to the corner, I think we can become creative, we can become innovative, and we should inspire people to actually do more, do more in research, right? It is, if it is not because of research, it is not because of multidisciplinary research, I don't think we get the vaccines uh, to COVID-19 that we have today. Today, we don't have one, but we have many different uh, COVID-19 vaccines of different, uh, different brands, which is good for India, which is good for Malaysia, yeah? Um, learning and teaching can take place in many forms and platform. Home education uh, is getting a lot of attention. So this is just sharing some of my findings. Yeah. So in Malaysia today, uh, again, due to COVID-19, uh, there are many parents now who have decided to actually do homeschooling for their children. They want to stop sending to school, but they want their children to actually do homeschooling by taking the O-level and the A-level at home and strategizing uh, topics or subjects that their children love to take or very passionate. So, so those, are, those are one of the um, outcome of COVID-19. So uh, homeschooling is, is coming in a very big way in Malaysia as well. So in, in, in what's to come and uh, with what we are doing today, there are loads of blended motion in education taking place. I think blended is the way forward. Blended offers creativity and innovation and must be explored more in research. Okay, can we go to the next page? So I think with that, I think uh, I have come up to my, uh, I've actually uh, um, presented everything that I wanted to present. And uh, again, thank you to the organizer for allowing me to share um, my presentation. It is certainly a great honor to be part of this extreme um, workshop. Yeah. And I wish all the participants a, a, a good five days workshop. I think there's a lot that people can learn. And certainly, um, uh, I'm just impressed with, uh, with the uh, management of this conference and also the uh, turnaround, you know, having so many uh, participants around. So thank you so much. And uh, I welcome if there are any questions, uh, Madam Samona Data. I pass it over back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, nice deliberation and enlightening 
Krishna has on a very, very important topic which has come up today. Uh, I request uh, uh, Mr. Imam Shamim. Shamim, sir, would you like to say a few words? Shamim, sir, uh, you need to unmute yourself, sir. I cannot hear you, sir. It's three o'clock. Madam, I think that he is yeah. having a network issue, so we can continue. Yeah, we can continue. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, ask the participants if uh, anyone would like to ask a question. I think uh, there is a question which is there in the chat box, sir. Uh, uh, A lot of appreciations are actually pouring in, so it's uh, I, well. I, I hope everybody is enjoying. Uh, enjoying it. Yeah. So uh, there is a there is I think uh, one question. Uh, it was really an informative okay. session. Would you please suggest a few blends through which a facilitator to attract both ordinary and extraordinary students under one roof, like say Noble Isaac. Bari, the youngest professor, a nine years old boy conducting university classes on calculus and such other difficult topics. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, if I understand your question correctly, yeah, um, I think uh, when Sami mentioned that I'm also a master trainer on NLP, uh, it's certainly uh, it is something that I, I didn't share any of those here. But it is also worthy for me to say that if you all have heard about neuro linguistic program, if you all have heard about uh, VAK, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, because all of us are very much similar or different by, the, by virtue of uh, the makeup that we are made, whether we are a visual person or student, whether we are auditory or whether we are kinesthetic. And if you are able, if you're able to actually um, use that information, uh, to actually approach a student who is, so a student who is very visual, if you approach him correctly and teach him the right way of, of what a visual student should be learning, then he could excel. But if you teach a visual student, um, uh, the approach um, by just talking and not showing auditory and all that, then the visual student will not be able to learn more. Vice versa, uh, an auditory student who uh, only needs to learn and to hear what, what the teacher is teaching is sufficiently okay. You don't have to show much because he will then register all the information and provide those back during the examination. And of course, the kinesthetic students are, are students who actually uh, need more caring. They, they, are, they, they need more help and more assistance and you have to be close to them. So what I'm trying to say here is, if you are able to mix a good classroom with all kinds of abilities, it's okay, but the teacher must have the repertoire or the skills to actually teach and approach the students. Because like I say, every human being are very similar or different by virtue of uh, VAK, virtu uh, visual, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, yeah? So uh, I'll give you one, ca one, uh, one case study in Malaysia. There's a state here called Tranganu. For the last 15 years, Trangano as a state came out first as the top uh, state that is actually producing uh, a lot of A students, uh, good students. And only in Trangano that students are not divided based on abilities. So you would have in one classroom students of, of the best abilities to students who are slow learners. They are all mixed in one classroom, but the teachers have the avenues and the skill and the knowledge to actually approach all the students according to the VAK. And it has proven for the last 15 years that by those strategies, students are able to be taught uh, in a way to improve uh, their learning skills, yeah? So to me, whether a student is genius or whether a student is slow in terms of learning, uh, we must not start by labeling. I think that is wrong to label that our teach our students or even our children uh, are slow or not very smart and all that because a maturity in education, maturity in learning is shown at a different um, level, different age uh, by different students. Yeah, some would actually mature uh, 
uh, matured uh, like a, slightly a, a little bit later in life, but others may mature in their primary years. So again, it's how we approach teaching and learning. Yeah, because human beings are very much similar or different. So uh, again, understanding whether you are left hemispheric or right hemispheric is also very important, right? Uh, Madam Simona Data, do you know whether you are left hemispheric brain, uh, uh, brain or you are right brain? Do you know that? Yeah, I think my left one is the dominant one. Okay, yeah, because if you are left, uh, if you are left dominant, if you are dominant with a left hemispheric, it means that you are. Uh, that you are you're good with what, uh, with uh, analytical, you know, with uh, but if you are if you are if you are a right brainer, certainly you are much more creative, yeah. You are a, a good problem solver and all that. So knowing that uh, as the basis also is key in understanding our students. So there's a lot that teachers must do. Yeah, teachers just don't teach and learn, but they must actually understand the profile of their learners. Uh, of course, this will take time because you have to be close to them. And I can see a lot of challenge, you know, when, when you have a class full of 45 students and, and most teachers will say, you know, how do you actually get close to them? Because there's too many of them, yeah? Uh, if you compare that to the classroom in Australia, New Zealand, in America, where they only have 20 or 15 in a classroom, it's much more manageable. But that, those are the challenges that we have. But certainly that also offers a lot of opportunity for us to do more research in how to understand our students, is it not? So mind power is, 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 is key um, in, in many things that we do. Um, so I'm, I'm a trainer for Neuro Linguistic Program. I change people's behavior. And I do a lot of profiling as well. So what my, uh, one of my uh, last uh, parting word here is um, there's no failure except feedback. Yeah. So if you hold to that uh, presupposition, uh, there's no failure except feedback, you can go far. Just remember that, write that down. There's no failure except feedback. Never take a failure as a failure because what is fail? F-A-I-L. Fail is first attempt in learning fail right so when you learn how to cycle up uh, when you learn how to buy uh, to learn how to uh, ride a bicycle before don't tell me that you know how to ride the bike automatically uh, i'm sure you would fall many times is it not when you learn to walk you must have fallen many times before you learn to walk but those are not failures those are just feedback yeah it's what we do it's 10 percent that happens to us but it is 90 percent of what we do that, that can actually propel us into uh, more successful stories yeah so likewise when we do research i think we must also uh, learn and keep on learning because there's no failure in research basically we just have to learn and become a better researcher in in, in years to come i hope i uh, i, I uh, what do you call uh, answer that question just now Madam uh, thank Simona. you very much sir there, there is another question uh, from dr uh, koster alam lashkar uh, what will be the most effective way or method for the students to learn in the online mode? Because what will be the conditions coming uh, in the post-COVID-19 situation? So if you can okay. kindly answer. All right. Interesting question. Like I say just now, uh, one of the challenges that we all have as ed educationists, as teachers, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in the COVID uh, era or in the new, no in the new normalcy is um, we have to beat the retention rate. We all know we have done a lot of survey and research, and we know that majority of our students uh, only can, can only last for the first seven to eight minutes. If we are not able to make the content appealing, if you're not able to make your lesson engaging, yeah, if you're not able to make it interactive, then we are are going to be losing out okay so it's very important it is paramount that students lessons are made to be engaging yeah now of course the next question you'll be asking is how do you make it engaging and how do you make it interactive okay so designing online courses is not the work of you alone it must be the work of a team you must have the content uh, expert you must have the technology expert around you must have the supporting team around to make sure that the courses are engaging 
it must be a course that without your presence, the students would actually be appealing to go through it at their own time. Okay. Now it is easier said than done. We have gone through this, yeah. And for us to come to this juncture, it took us, I think, over the last 13 months to experiment, to change, to revise our content, to add on the technology so that, you know, when you when students press the button, you know, a, a funny face, a funny clown would come out, pop up. Uh, so that, that makes students laugh, that makes students uh, smile. But the most important thing is that makes it much more engaging. Yeah. So when you have courses that, 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 that warrants the student to actually touch a certain button or touch a certain key and, and to do things, that can make it inter interactive, but making it interactive is not enough. You must make it interesting as well. So how do you make it appealing? Uh, so those are the things that you have to design, okay? You must have the dynamics of different professionals in your team. And I'm sure you have that in India. India is one of the uh, leaders in, 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 in new technology, yeah? Uh, I, I think India is doing well in that area. I think you have many resources, you have a big population, you have a big uh, population of academics in India as well. I think uh, we in Malaysia are, are, are looking forward to be able to learn more from you. Uh, but certainly we can also learn from each other. Yeah. So basically, um, you are right, uh, making the class interesting um, uh, um, or making appealing is a challenge. And we have to actually approach that in a way that we are only better tomorrow. We have done good yesterday, we are doing good today, but we, we must always think and revise what we have so that tomorrow lesson will be much more engaging, much more interactive and much more appealing. It is, it is easier said than done, I know, but because we have, we've gone through this, but it is possible, you know, just do what Nike says, you know, Nike, Nike says, just do it. Yeah, uh, you, we must stop about putting a limiting belief in what we do. Uh, so sometimes people say it's difficult, you cannot do it. Uh, those, are just, those are just limiting belief. We can do it, yeah? Uh, the sky is the limit. And I, I think by working collaboratively uh, between nations, between institutions, Malaysia, India, Sri Lanka, Korea, and all that, I think we can, we can do wonders. Thanks. Thank okay, you madam. very much, sir. Uh, uh, can we take another question, sir? One very relevant uh, issue coming up from uh, several participants. They are asking that uh, how can we implement blended learning in remote tribal villages where you know students uh, for teaching and learning, as they have, uh, they do not have any technology except the keypad, cell phone. So how can we do that? What can be the possible? Okay, yeah. that's a, a very uh, another very good question. Um, certainly, if you if you we look at Malaysia and uh, the geography location of Malaysia and also the um, the what do you call the um, the nation itself. And if I were to compare Malaysia and India, of course, India we are talking about you know you being a massive nation, you know, from north, south, east, and west. I think um, you are hundreds, if not thousands of times much bigger than Malaysia. Even though Malaysia, even though Malaysia is not a big country at all, yeah, I think if you look at Malaysia, if you look at Sri Lanka, or maybe about UK, uh, standard by far, we are very much uh, close in terms of sizes as compared to India. But even though uh, uh, Malaysia also have such difficulty that, uh, I mean, uh, in Malaysia, um, the, the whole nation is not, uh, in many ways, we are not, uh, we should not be equated as being similar. So if you look at East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, for example, where um, it is still dominantly um, uh, surrounded by tropical forests, you know, there are so many people or communities that are out of reach. I mean, they're not out of reach, but they are away uh, from uh, technology. And then of course, uh, students, uh, in those areas also have technological um, problem in, term, in terms of accessing uh, Wi-Fi and internet. So what the Ministry of Education in Malaysia are doing is, um, we are very fortunate and, and, and really honored to have um, teachers who are very committed and dedicated to actually travel to those areas and to actually still come and meet their students. Yeah, uh, They would even mail 
um, work assignments to those students just to ensure that they have all the worksheets and all that. So basically, I understand that sometimes the geographical location, sometimes are uh, barriers to learning, especially when you wanted to do blended learning. But we must focus on solution. Don't focus on problems. So what can you do? So like the Malaysian case, uh, the teachers actually uh, use postage uh, by sending materials to them, by visiting them uh, occasionally, but on a frequent basis, that also helps. Yeah. But of course, I, I can only imagine India because in India is so big of a nation and, and it must be very expensive to actually venture out into all that. But certainly you have to focus on being creative. What can you do and how can you do better? Yeah, They need to learn. We need to democratize education. Right? They must not be marginalized because they are far away. So uh, sometimes it is okay to still maintain the conventional way of teaching and learning. Yeah? It doesn't have to be online all the way. Online technology is not the solution to all problems. It is not the silver bullet uh, in education. Yeah? It, is not, it is just an enabler in education. You must remember that. Yeah? So whether, wherever they are, uh, it, is, it is imperative that teachers be creative in trying to help them learn. We have to ensure that we have to provide and democratize education for all whether they don't have buildings, whether they don't have, they don't have technology, uh, we must help them to learn. And by virtue of actually, even that means uh, by giving them, um, you know, textbooks, printed books or sending them printed material, then we have to do that. Okay, Madam Samana. Right, right, right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we'll take uh, just one last question, sir. Uh, okay. We have a question from uh, Ms. Sarita. He's asking that what would be the ideal approach for integration in technology in blended learning without the risk of technological addiction? If you can kindly okay. share. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's uh, another brilliant question. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that we, again, as a reminder to myself and a reminder to all uh, educationists in India and in Malaysia, or where, whoever uh, you are uh, in this uh, workshop, we must remember that technology is never a silver bullet. I'm saying that again here. Yeah, It is not the solution for all. It is not the best solution for all. It is just an enabler. Yeah. So uh, what, kind of, what, what, what kind of technology best being integrated? Uh, again, um, that must be um, customized uh, by the by the uh, local conditions of the college or school or the educational setting, because different setting, different educational colleges may have different uh, requirement. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, when you talk about online learning, you must also have. Um, uh, LMS or learning management system, right? To help you to manage the learning and teaching. Again, LMS also varies between nations. It varies between colleges and, 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 and settings because uh, at the end of the day, you must ask yourself, what do you want? Uh, what advancement, how advanced do you want uh, the technology? And what is the purpose of the, of the technology? That must be answered first before you actually adopt. Because there are so many issues or so many cases where uh, people are so excited about technology and they spend so much money on technology, millions of dollars uh, purchasing software and hardware and all that. At the end of the day, uh, they, if they get the wrong technology or something that, 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 that is not useful to actually help them attain uh, their educational goal, then it defeats the purpose. Yeah? It is, you are better off using the basic technology and, and use it uh, much more productively. Productively. After all, if you look at how we define technology is, even when people are still using chalk and board, yeah, chalk and board are also part of technology, isn't it? If you think, it, if you think of technology um, and, and define it, uh, so as, as, as we progress in life, um, people, people have changed, technological change are happening every second. So again, don't be too fast, too quick on actually... Um, Choosing a particular technology, you must, number one, answer the very question, what do you want? And what, what are your immediate goals on using a particular technology? Okay, Madam Simona? Right, 
Right. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, answering this question. I mean, it's something that we also, being the teachers, we also are facing this on a regular basis. Our students, they're complaining, you know, about uh, so many things. So uh, that's it. that is definitely very, very important. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think we still have some time. Can we take one no last problem. question? I think I, I just want yeah, I just wanted to uh, say this uh, one last thing is, yeah. uh, again, I'd like to invite yeah, um, uh, Adamans University and also fellow participant, wherever, whatever institution you come from, if you wanted to have um, educational collaboration with University of Utara, Malaysia, we are most welcome. Uh, we look forward to have joint research with all of you. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we also have different uh, proposals that we can shoot to all of you and perhaps a call for you to participate. Um, uh, I, I think the world is becoming very small now. We have to learn from each other. I think collaborative research and interdisciplinary research is very powerful. Yeah, uh, I think we can do more. So I would like to welcome uh, any collaboration or any cooperative research in the future. Uh, to that, to that uh, uh, effect as well, uh, I, I think I also wanted to invite if any one of you, any institution wanted to uh, follow up with uh, the possibility of sending a memorandum of understanding MOU, uh, we look forward um, on doing that as well, okay? And uh, also on that note, uh, in the future when the COVID-19 situation is well contained, I would like to invite uh, students from your institutions to come over to Malaysia as part of a mobility uh, trip to Malaysia and vice versa. We can also send our students to your institutions for mobility and we can also do uh, cross uh, training yeah, between our uh, faculty members. Okay, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a master trainer on a, a neuro linguistic program. If you wanted me to do a local basic introductory of NLP and how that can impact human beings and, and your future life, uh, I'm, I'm here. So uh, let's uh, work with each other and I think we can make the world a better place for all of us to live. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I wish you a very good evening. I wish you a very good conference and I wish all of you a greater life in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Professor. very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank, uh, you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor, for your inspiring and thought-provoking presentation. So I hope your message made a great impact on the participants. Uh, professor spoke about new normalcy, and also we can call it as new normal or new normalcy or whatever it might be. In this situation, how we can involve more learning and research and how we can help students in learning as a research. He stressed the point about the, the change and flexibility, visibility, and collaboration. Therefore, he triggered up my mind about uh, the quality of teaching and learning and quality of research and collaboration and how to move forward and support our fellow researchers. Professor asked a major question that whether we can all uh, available resources, how we can use the available resources, optimum utilization of resources. He also talked about the timely use of um, a need for blended approach. This is not a new for UEM because now, uh, even now, uh, even for three, four years back only now, he was talking about these, you know, flexible learning and how we can collaborate and, um, you know, uh, MOUs and things like that. Because now, uh, even I involved in um, um, uh, linking the Ministry of Education and all, now we had a very, very, very good uh, link program with the Ministry of Education Sri Lanka and um, and two other universities um, in Prague. And therefore, let us flexible, speedy, and visible and collaborate. Nothing is impossible. Let us collaborate. I think UEM is the eminent, UEM motto is eminent management university, I think. So let's, let us collaborate with you, UEM. And it's really a thought provoking presentation, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation and your valuable uh, time. Thank you. thank you, sir. Uh, Shamim sir and uh, uh, thank you Dean sir for uh, such a wonderful presentation great uh, to see you virtually 
and uh, i would like to thank you from myself and from uh, team uh, and at the same time we would also like to extend our uh, hands in the collaboration and as well as exchange programs we will definitely work it out in the near future uh, yeah and uh, myself uh, shumana we are actually representing now and all our teams are also here uh, so of course they are listening and uh, we will definitely work it out sir uh, thank you for extending your helping hands thank you so much thank so you. over to you shumana all right thank you so much thank you again for the opportunity given have a good evening and uh, um keep smiling yeah. thank you thank, thank you, you very much sir <laughs> thank you thank you okay i i uh, thank uh, dr zakaria for presenting this wonderful presentation again i would also like to thank uh, professor shamim for summarizing his lecture very nicely and uh, presenting uh, such a nice uh, uh, description uh, i would like to thank dr pratita vishwas ma'am for uh, you know extending her thanks to uh, dr zakaria and uh, saying a few words at the end of the session so with this we come to the end of uh, today's session uh, i would like to uh, let all the participants know that uh, tomorrow again we have two uh, more very very uh, enriching interactive sessions in line the first one will be by ms sultana kanis fatema who is an executive director and early childhood education specialist and she will be uh, talking on uh, early childhood education and research in the 21st century from dhaka and uh, the second session will be that of uh, professor mohammad aslam who is a professor in tourism management department of tourism management as sabarak moa at university of sri lanka and he will be speaking on responsible research innovations and research integrated development so our session tomorrow will start at 11:30 am in the morning so um, i wish all of you very good health and uh, i uh, uh, we will meet again tomorrow in the morning at 11:30 am so please stay safe and be well thank you 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 so with this we end this session right ma'am yes yes thank you good day to all recording stopped